Hello everyone, I'm Tony Byrne from Real Story Group, joined today by my partner and longtime collaborator, Teresa Regley, who's a principal and managing partner here at RSG. And today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to have a fireside chat about uh, a really sort of dynamic topic right now, which is digital asset, digital marketing asset management in the broader digital marketing toolkit. Uh, we are definitely seeing DAM evolving from being kind of a back office function into really much more of a, of a leading engine of, of digital marketing strategies. And so there's no one in the world more qualified to talk about this transition than Teresa. So just a few housekeeping notes. All of you uh, will get a copy of this deck afterwards. Those of you who are Real Story Group subscribers, you'll have access to a full recorded video of this. If you want to have a little Twitter back channel around this, just use the hashtag that's in the lower right, which is RSGDAM. And then the other thing is if you have any questions or any comments about anything that we're talking about today, go to the uh, questions panel in your uh, GoToMeeting control panel and just ask us a question and I'll be ducking in and out to see what comments you have. Uh, and we'll weave those into the conversation. So for those of you who are new to Real Story Group, uh, Teresa, let's talk a little bit about the company to just give some context here. Uh, we're an analyst firm, but a different kind of analyst firm. We work just for customers, enterprise customers of technology. We analyze the strengths and weaknesses of the tools, publish very hard-hitting, in fact, the artist hitting research uh, about these vendors that allow you to compare them head-to-head. -head. And then through a subscription process, we do a couple of things. First, we kind of advise and mentor you on successful technology selection. But for those of you who have already made these decisions, we also have tools that allow you to benchmark your digital effectiveness against your peers so you can get more value out of the investments you've already made. And we cover a variety of different digital workplace and marketing technologies, web content and experience management, collaboration social software, campaign lead management, portals, ECM. But today we're going to be talking about a really important uh, technology, an increasingly central technology, which is digital and marketing asset management. So um, I, I think this is a really interesting way to, to, to kick off, which is basically, Teresa, you know, how are we all doing? Um, you know, have we solved our biggest challenges? Does asset management have been around for about 15 years? The tools have been out there. There are people who've made a career of this. Um, are, are we getting there? And if not, what are the biggest barriers? Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for the intro, Tony. Um, yeah, this is a, a, a key question. I think that um, we, we like to talk, uh, especially in, in the analyst world and, and those of us who've worked a long time in the industry, uh, we tend to get in, in conversations where uh, we talk about big ideas and we, we espouse big ideas. Um, but there's a lot of basic problems that unfortunately we, we haven't quite solved yet. And I'm just going to highlight um, a few of those here. And these are the ones that I, that I tend to see uh, the, the most common. Uh, and so I'll just talk briefly, briefly about each of these, and, and maybe, Tony, if you have, you have thoughts as well, please, uh, please, please share with everybody uh, as we chat. Um, I think a lot of people pick the tool before um, they actually have a, a strategy and a plan. Um, there's, a, there's a sense among a lot of, of people that spending money on technology will, will solve problems. Um, and often if you rush to, to buy something without doing the proper research and really being strategic about it, um, you're going to probably buy the wrong thing uh, if you're not thinking about your, your use cases uh, through and through. I think historically there's been a lack of executive support for DAM. Um, that's changing, fortunately, and that's because of the fact that DAM is becoming a, a bigger part of the marketing toolkit. Um, it's becoming a, a very central part of the marketing toolkit. It's very much a foundational engine for the marketing toolkit. So that lack of executive support um, is, is, is changing, uh, but it's still not completely permeated um, in terms of of actually getting executives behind um, fully, uh, and so I, I, I still am seeing this as, as a problem. But fortunately, it's it's starting to uh, to get solved. Uh, lack of governance, I think, is is still an issue, uh, whereby we we don't necessarily have a structure to support 
um, not just DAM implementations, but just broader digital marketing um, integrated toolkits uh, where we, we have lots of separate siloed projects without one big picture. Um, of course, metadata continues to be a problem. A lot of the, the very fancy demos that we see of products uh, are really uh, tend to be things that, that require a lot of metadata that's not there for it to work correctly. Um, and then finally, uh, a lack of uh, integration uh, components. So um, APIs still aren't very good in the DAM world, uh, and that's causing problems in terms of uh, connecting it to the broader toolkit. So we'll just yeah, it's interesting. You know, none of these are necessarily like unique to DAM, but I think the last two are, are particularly germane right now that, you know, everybody says metadata is important for any information management, but for, for DAM it's almost essential. I think you're right that these demos that we see sort of assume that you have really rich metadata, and if you don't, then obviously you really need to pause. And then the integration thing is a really big deal because I think a lot of developers who are used to seeing richer APIs, more modern REST APIs, sometimes are surprised when they look at these systems. So, yeah, really interesting sure. stuff. Okay. Next. So next up, we've got uh, the the damn marketplace, and you know, Teresa, you've been following this space for at least ten years. I think you know, uh, you've watched a lot of these systems grow up. Um, let's talk a little bit about how it's evolved, particularly how it's evolved recently. There's been, you know, a, a lot of activity around this space. Yeah, indeed. I'll just uh, go right into a, a sort of graphic that that we use at the marketplace here. Um, and these are the, the vendors that we evaluate in our research. And, and for those of you who are new to Real Story Group you know, on the line, as Tony mentioned, um, we have very hard-hitting research um, and, and very critical evaluations of, of these tools. Um, and they're all very uh, different tools that, that, we, that we look at across the DAM marketplace. And when I say different, I don't necessarily mean that they're different in terms of, of what they do. Um, DAM tools are, are kind of like cars in the sense that, that, that their purpose is to take you from point A to point B. Um, DAMs as, as a whole are, are there to help you manage your, your uh, video and audio and, and images and brand assets uh, you know, better. Um, so the functionality is pretty similar, but one of the, the big changes in the industry, especially over the last couple of years, uh, is, is everything that has to do with, with the cloud. Um, there's also been uh, a lot of uh, proliferation more recently around um, the, some maturity in the, in the open source market. It's definitely not as rich as, as the open source web content management market or document management market, but we are seeing more use of, of open source DAM uh, as well. But I'll specifically talk about the, the sort of two biggest blocks on this slide, uh, which are, which are the, the, the basically the bifurcation between on-premise and the, the tools that have historically been uh, installed on-premise versus uh, the very large um, growth of the, the cloud um, uh, vendors in this space. And uh, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more to that in a second, but uh, also the, the bottom left is, is, is interesting to speak about because we have there big enterprise vendors, uh, sort of the household names of, of the broader enterprise content management world like EMC and Oracle and OpenText. Uh, and, and these vendors, of course, are selling uh, broader suites or marketing suites or enterprise content management suites. Um, and they're also considering DAM as a, as a, as a component of something bigger. Um, and, and we all know sort of how, how that turns out. Yes, <laughs> we do. Um, indeed, we have an expression at, at RSG that we like to use, which is uh, "sweets aren't always sweet," uh, and and usually "dam" is an afterthought um, when it comes to uh, a lot of the larger vendors that are out there. Um, I'll just go right into the the cloud uh, piece that I was speaking to, and I think it would be interesting, um, Tony, as well, if you'd comment on this from a from a broader uh, marketing toolkit perspective. Which is, you know, historically we've had a lot of um, vendors on premise, and and there's been, as I mentioned over the last couple of years, a lot more vendors uh, that are that are 100% uh, cloud. Um, and I've come up with a, a sort of expression called cloud cloud, which is <laughs> how much uh, experience do these vendors really have, uh, and do they actually support, and are they actually updating their code base so that they can architecturally take advantage of, of cloud uh, infrastructures that we have today. Uh, so you can see the movement here between these two, and I'll just shift 
This is actually the slide from about two years ago. Um, and then this is the slide uh, uh, now where I just updated this a couple months ago, where you can see the vendors are, are shifting more towards the cloud side and have more experience um, in the cloud, which I think fits with the overall movement of digital marketing technology. Would you agree with that, Tony? Yeah, and, and, and it's always interesting then to make the distinction, you know, which ones are really cloud native um, and are there opportunities for multi-tenancy? Some people don't want multi-tenancy, of course. I think what's also interesting that we see certainly in, the, in some other segments is that the vendors who are traditionally on-premise, they might offer some platform as a service. In other words, they might provide some managed cloud services, but then the issue is like who's actually managing that, right? Um, and, and Or do you have to do it yourself? Basically, okay, the tool's been certified to run on Amazon, but you've got to work out all of the details. So it sounds like you know there's a lot of issues still to sort out there. Definitely, and and I would say that this, the the vendors that are on the left hand side of this uh, this spectrum here, uh, they're really much more offering managed services. Uh, it's it's not uh, it's not uh, in contrast, I would say, to the to the vendors on the right hand side. The ones that are furthest to the right, they're they're multi tenant. Um, they're the more pure software as a service. Uh, and, and the ones in between offer uh, a mix of of different uh, of different options. So. Remember that when you're looking at this market or really any uh, any piece of enterprise technology, when you hear the word cloud, it doesn't it's not a binary thing. Uh, and we have a lot of things in our research, a lot of our evaluation criteria now uh, looks at this and 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 how successfully um, the vendors perform in, in these different deployment models. Yeah, I, I love this cloud cloud. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, we might want to trademark that. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> It's great. All right. Um, well, let's start, Tony. I'm going to put a question back to you. Um, one of the questions I think that we all get as an analyst team uh, is, what about other tools that uh, say or purport to uh, manage digital assets? And and I think this this comes out of a long history of people just equating DAM with, well, you can just put images into a central repository, and, and that's DAM. So. What about in the WCM market, and uh, and even with, of course, the the uh, the everywhere SharePoint? Um, what can they do when it comes to image and video management? Yeah, uh, SharePoint happens, so uh, you know it, it it is ubiquitous, and certainly you know both document management and web content management tools have always, at the end of the day, they have a repository for WCM tools. They've always been able to have a, a, a some sort of a library where you could have binary assets, and those have become more sophisticated over time. Um, and so you can use it as kind of a damn light in the context of your digital team producing digital experiences, primarily web experiences. And so that that's the scope of what you think about in terms of asset management. Sure, that's that's going to suffice. Um, I think that the that a couple things. First, I think we we've, we've learned that document management tools like SharePoint, which you see here, are not particularly good at storing and managing assets. They just treat them as another file, and they don't take advantage of all of the different things that creative and marketing people need to do around these assets. So I think that that debate has 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 been lost. Uh, it's been held and lost by ECM vendors. On the web content management side, you've seen players like Adobe and Core Media and others develop and increasingly build out their dam subsystems to actually now be separate tools or modules that in some cases they even sell separately and so in some cases you know you'll hear vendor marketing people say well okay you've got a dam problem I can solve that too but the thing you have to remember particularly with Adobe is that this is still really it's not really an enterprise dam per se and we could get into a lot of discussion about what that really means, but it's really designed to be a dam for the digital team. Now, the digital team is important, but you may have a number of other things that you're trying to do around digital and particularly marketing asset management that are well beyond that where a dam from your WCM vendor is, is likely not going to suffice. Indeed, and I think a lot of what we, we end up seeing uh, when we help our subscribers uh, is is that they're in a situation where they've they've hit a ceiling uh, when it comes to this this sort of lightweight dam that they might be doing in another tool, uh, or it becomes you know, when dam goes from a departmental implementation to a more enterprise uh, implementation, it's it's got to support much more often than than digital, uh, especially when we're working with with agency uh, subscribers. 
who specifically might be supporting a multi-channel campaign uh, or a, a CMO who's thinking, well, I need, to, I need to manage all of my marketing assets for all kinds of channels from, from a single tool, be able to do transformation, be able to change assets on the fly into different formats. Uh, that, that's where they, they tend to hit a ceiling with these uh, digitally oriented tools. Yeah. So let, let's move on to kind of a, a, a natural sort of follow on to this or since we're talking about scope and I'll just uh, remind people that if you have any questions or commentary about what you're hearing, feel free to jump into the questions tab and let us know in your GoToMeeting control panel and we'll address it real time. We'll also have some time for some Q&A at the end as well. And if you're on Twitter, you can use the hashtag RSGDAM, and we'll obviously continue the conversation there. So this is a really interesting topic, um, DAM as workflow. And workflow means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And I, I think we're learning some things around creative processes here and what's the proper role of a DAM. And I think, Teresa, you certainly called this out. And we've seen it even among our subscriber base, kind of different types of thinking about what's the proper scope for a digital asset management system. So you, you, you tell us, should we use our, our, our DAM for, for creative workflows, whatever that means? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> uh, I, I would say DAM is good for review and approval. Uh, and, and really, the, when we think of the origins of DAM, it was to put final assets in a central repository and make them findable. And, and really, for the most part, that's what DAMs are, are still engineered to do. Uh, and, and then there's a, a very small you know, end of the workflow sort of facility that they have where maybe someone at an agency or someone on the creative team is dropping a, a, a final draft, I like to call it, uh, asset into uh, a DAM. And maybe a few people are reviewing it and, uh, and then approving or, or making some comments. But the technology uh, is starting to blur a little bit between DAM and, and what we would call COM or Creative Operations Management. Um, for those of you who attend the Henry Stewart conferences this year, we've had a, a separate track specifically on that. Uh, so let's just show some examples here of, of kind of what, what does that mean. Um, and it's really about collaboration. So we talk about DAM as a workflow tool, but really the way it's evolving is not a, a linear workflow, it's more of a, let's, it's a space, it's a collaborative space. And uh, Tony, who covers collaboration technology for the enterprise in, in a, a lot of depth, I think this is a, a, an interesting thing to, to think about, is, 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 our, is the future of our, of our uh, digital workplace really that, that linear, or is it about bringing people together to collaborate and, and, and comment? And with DAM, Creative technology creatives in general aren't particularly linear people, right? They, they're more organic, uh, and they more want to be in a, a, a situation where they can they can be in the same space and uh, and, and comment and and even do just simple uh, simple editing is also where um, where DAM has been going. Rather than uh, workflow and, and sort of a, a creating more elaborate workflows, it's around just enabling people to do very simple things. Uh, and, and, and maybe clip something or, or create a variant of an asset uh, to be able to adapt it more for downstream than, than everything that comes before. So how, how does this... Uh, yeah, sort of, I mean, yeah. And we're seeing this in the WCM space, we're seeing this in document management, really a preference for ad hoc collaboration and kind of a state transition model rather than these kind of process flow workflows, which are really important for certain important enterprise processes like, you know, processing insurance claims and things like that, but they don't really work for people who are working jointly on an asset or even like a, a PowerPoint or something like that. And so this notion of more collaboration and transitioning from one environment to another um, and being able to track changes that way, uh, that model is, is ubiquitous and, and really important um, and distinction I think that you're making in digital asset management systems. I guess the, the one thing that does come to mind though is this notion of job jackets and more kind of formalized processes in creative teams. Um, but, but that seems like that's more something of a creative operations management tool than a DAM tool. Is, is that fair to say? I think it is fair to say some DAM systems do have the notion of job jackets, uh, but those jobs are more, uh, or the functionality of a job jacket in a DAM is much more related to pushing 
uh, and, and where does it go out to and what is the distribution paradigm that needs to happen when it comes to the assets in this job uh, versus everything that comes before and the creative process of actually uh, creating and, and, and uh, the initial formulation of those assets. So, so that's a key difference and, and when we think about the whole end-to-end -end creative agency metaphor of a job jacket, uh, we think of that whole spectrum. But the technology doesn't really follow that whole spectrum. It's, it's more different pieces that address different parts and DAM is still really more focused on that latter part. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Teresa, we've gotten in some interesting questions and I thought maybe we could just pause here. It could be that a couple of these we're going to address in the next couple of slides, so if so, just let me know. Um, okay. But uh, we've heard from Andrew. He works for a book publisher and they're looking for a solution that does both workflow or I'll assume whatever collaborative work in process um, as well as the final asset store and discovery. And they're looking at Dropbox as a potential collaborative working tool. And do we have any, any views on that possibility? And I think it, you know, Dropbox is one end of the spectrum, but then also I, mean, I think Box has said that they have put out videos that you can use them as a digital asset management for this kind of collaboration. So yep. smiling there. <laughs> well, those of you who can see me, uh, you know, sort of winced a little bit there. Um, it's a little bit, it's, let's put it this way, it's kind of like imagine you're taking a bicycle onto a Formula One race course. That's the, uh, that's the analogy I would use. So, um, you can, you've got Dropbox, you've got Box, uh, you know, we, we look at these tools specifically um, in our cloud file sharing and ECM research. Um, they're not digital asset management systems, <laughs> and I, I feel like I say that probably ten times a week, um, and and that's because they're 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 places you 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 put files, and yes, it's a central repository. Uh, you can store images in there. Uh, when it comes to the fundamental uh, pieces of a of a dam, the, the functional things that dams should do, uh, Dropbox and Box do not uh, allow you to do. Uh, image transformations, for example. So if you have an EPS file and you need it in, in lots of different formats for lots of different channels, um, it's not going to transform those files for you. Uh, it's not going to allow you to take an Adobe Creative Suite file and, and parse that and have child assets with a parent asset and be able to do uh, group, grouped metadata around uh, that master file and those yeah, children. It's, it's like a dumb binary file. I mean, it might as well yeah. be a Word doc at that point. Yeah, yeah, it might as well be a Word doc. Uh, yeah. it, there's so many what I would call special handling rules that, that a dam has uh, for very specialized creative files uh, that you're simply not going to get with, with Dropbox. Uh, and again, the, the, the idea of, of workflow there is, is sort of, uh, it's just a kind of a silly idea. Um, you know, the, 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 it's, it's trying to take a, a, something that's a very simple place to just put files um, and, and do much more than it's, than it's engineered to do. Okay. Uh, we're getting some more interesting questions, but I think that they're going to be addressed here in the next. So why don't we move on to the next topic, sure. and uh, this may then take us. And so, uh, yeah, so this is interesting. This acronym MAM has been around in the industry. Sometimes people refer to it as media asset management, uh, other times marketing asset management. Um, yeah, so, you know, what is it? What does it mean? Should, should, should we care about this? How yeah. Much well, we definitely should care about it. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'll just use a, um, DAM is a very uh, difficult acronym, I would say. And I, and I, I don't admit, say, yeah. It's, it's, it's something that in, in big companies uh, and, and all over, I mean, even my mother still laughs that says I'm a DAM analyst. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think there's a, there's a bit of a, a, a problem that people have embracing DAM simply because the acronym sounds so silly. Uh, so MAM gets thrown around a lot as well. Uh, sometimes it refers to media asset management, sometimes it refers to marketing asset management. And to give you a, a, a sort of parallel in the educational world, um, today I was, uh, I was lunching with um, a gent by the name of Simon Tanner who runs the Digital Asset Management Master's Program at King's College in London. And he was saying that as soon as they added the word media to their program, uh, they got a whole bunch more students. And then they added marketing to their program and they got even more students. Uh, so the perception that you're managing media um, or the perception that you might be managing marketing assets 
makes it seem more valuable than just sort of the, the general term of, of saying digital asset management. So if you are in a situation where um, you're trying to justify uh, investment in DAM or you're trying to convince uh, your CMO that you need, you know, you need to, uh, to, to, to move forward with, uh, with a project, um, you might want to talk about managing marketing and media assets rather than just digital assets because it's a little less specific uh, and, and using these terms tends to, to rally more people around the cause, uh, we're finding, and, and many people in the industry are finding. So I would actually encourage you to, to, to use some of these words a little bit more than just saying, damn. But, but, but let me just challenge this idea, though. Are the damn vendors there? I mean, we're talking about media assets and marketing assets. Are the vendors there in terms of broadening the scope of what they do to accommodate these rather different, they're not you know, still images? Um, Meet, you know, marketing assets are complex compound documents that are used in multi-channel environments and video courses, all kinds of complications. Are the vendors there? Uh, well, the, the vendors are really in, in one camp or the other in general. Uh, I would say the majority of the vendors anyway. So uh, if you've attended some of our other webinars, or obviously if you're a subscriber, you're well aware that we rate and evaluate vendors based on various mm -hmm. use cases. And there are specific vendors who just are about managing images, uh, and that's the, the sort of more traditional digital asset management, you know, image management world. Um, but then there's others that are much more focused on media, uh, and increasingly there's ones that are more focused on marketing assets. And when I say marketing assets, they, they might be good at doing short-term, uh, short-form video, uh, web-oriented video, integrating with YouTube, things like that. Uh, so it just speaks to the use cases that are so important to think about when you're uh, selecting a dam tool. Okay, great. So, uh, digital asset management is interesting because, um, like a lot of things that are you know deep into a work process, it can be very industry specific. Um, and so when you see particular industries like certainly consumer product goods, media and entertainment, that sort of thing, you know, to what extent do they have industry specific challenges and, and, and are vendors and others really addressing those? Yeah, there's a lot of interesting industry-specific challenges, and uh, you know it, we're we're fortunate at Real Story Group that we get to work with such a huge variety of of uh, different sorts of companies, uh, and you know we have a uh, we we have a really awesome tool that I'm sure Tony will talk about a little bit more uh, later, which is which is our Real Score tool, and this allows our subscribers to uh, use a, a series of effectiveness models to benchmark uh, their performance in. In, uh, in digital asset management or in web content management or, or campaign management, whatever, whatever your focus may be. And, and what we've done here on this particular chart is to, is to look at how, uh, how well different verticals are, are performing um, in terms of their own digital asset management uh, uh, implementations. And I think you probably won't be surprised to see perhaps uh, that, that professional services firms, uh, CPG and retail, and, and media and publishing firms are, are, are sort of more performant with their dam systems uh, than, than perhaps you know, higher ed or, or public sector and government, et cetera. And, and there's a few reasons for this. Uh, first of all, it's, it's really the, the um, business imperative that, that uh, especially, I'll, I'll just speak to media and CPG, um, that they have in, in distributing uh, media and, and marketing material. Uh, it, basically, they can't exist without, without doing that. They can't, uh, they can't sell the product if they don't. And I think a unique challenge, I'll, I'll just specifically go to uh, you know, CPG and retail, that, that comes up a lot with our subscriber base, is uh, you know, integrating with, with product data uh, and, and the immense amount of data that, that exists in these large companies about the products that, that they're selling. Um, and it's not just data that they need to market these products, it's also nutritional data, uh, regulatory data, and, and things that they, they need to make available to uh, retailers, to partners, to legal groups, to different government regulatory uh, bodies that, that need to make sure that the product's legal to sell in particular countries based on the ingredient list. Uh, that kind of material is now very intimately tied to digital assets. Uh, and that's a very complicated integration challenge. And 
while I see uh, CPGs addressing that, it's also becoming more prominent in manufacturing firms. I mean, even in the public sector, uh, you have museums uh, saying, well, we have to integrate the, the data about our physical objects with, with our digital assets. So big challenges yeah. there to connect data. Yeah, yeah, and certainly financial services, I think, is, is another one uh, under uh, extreme digital transformation right now. And kind of just in the last year, we've noticed among our financial services subscribers a, a really growing interest. We've got a lot of really good questions here, so Teresa, I'll let you advance some slides as you see fit, but I'm going to have you do, do, do that while we're answering some questions. So the first one is from Yunwei Guo, which, um, which really uh, gets, I think, to some of this effectiveness. She's saying, how do you measure damn user experience and performance? Like, how do you benchmark it? Uh, well, it, it, we like to, at Real Story Group, when, when it comes to measuring usability, uh, it's really, it's, it's uh, fitness to purpose. Can you accomplish the task uh, at hand? And with every use case uh, scenario that we have, that we use to rate and evaluate DAM products, uh, you know, that's what we have in mind. So if, if we're evaluating, for example, um, the basic brand management use case, we're thinking, okay, um, how intuitive is the default search interface? Am I able to navigate by various categories? Can I have a brand specific portal uh, if I'm uh, a multi brand? If I'm in a multi brand scenario, uh, so that that usefulness or that usability of a particular uh, tool it it really depends on what the scenario is. There is not an absolute. Uh, correctness yeah. for it, uh, and I think that's an important. But thing over to time, know. we built up a set of criteria that we can do some pretty deep comparisons. So, okay, good. So Graham's asking a question that we hear a lot, which is opinion on solution design for common alternatives, and he's going to give a couple here. A, a centralized dam as one ring to rule them all, or B, a centralized dam that is integrated with other point solutions other maybe asset or light asset systems in a more modulated, in a more modular architecture? Yeah, I see both. I think we, we're, it's very common that we see both, uh, especially in uh, large companies. I, I would say most commonly I see multiple dams in media companies. So thinking back to that last slide, um, you know, media was, was, was second or third in terms of um, uh, dam maturity. And, and I think that's largely because if you're if you're ESPN uh, or you're a major some other major broadcaster, you probably have different systems to manage uh, your broadcast media that you're putting out on TV or or on your TV anywhere uh, app, your streaming apps, your video on demand apps, uh, versus what you're using to manage a brand, your logos, um, and and uh, maybe even your short your short videos that are um, that are going out for marketing. So very different modular um, sorts of scenarios that, that right. might exist. Right. Whereas other companies a lot on the industry and the size and things like that. Yeah, exactly. You know, we yeah. haven't actually talked much about you know the the kind of some of the new integration imperatives. But Adrian's asking a really interesting question here. Given all the quote unquote channels that are being used by CPG retail shoppers, mobile, online, social, web, broadcast, can you comment on the importance of publishing? And I guess in this case, I would think of it distributing media assets and. And, and where are we um, in this in the technology world today around distributing media assets from a dam to all of these different customer endpoints? Not very far along, <laughs> to be frank. Um, it, it, really, the, the big companies that uh, sell multiple products. So when I think about these big CPG uh, retail companies, they're they're still trying to get a 360 view of the customer and how they actually use these channels. Uh, so the the idea of being able to uh, take multiple assets and distribute them uh, in meaningful ways at the right time when you know a shopper is in a store or there's a sale going on or whatever it might be, uh, it, it's it exists theoretically and and in particular channels there's companies that are doing it well as a point to a particular channel, uh, but in terms of that single source multi-channel distribution with the full picture of the customer. That's still very much up here, um, and and uh, a sort of high-level conceptual thing that we're working towards, versus uh, anybody really doing it perfectly as of yet. Yeah, and one thing that we saw that was interesting this year was even some pricing models around that from dam vendors, where even I think in this case it was an on-premise vendor, and it wasn't that they were charging for a particular connector, but they were charging for how many different systems were going to be consuming this content. So it was almost a, 
a delivery or consumption model as opposed to a seat model or a uh, CPU model for licensing. Uh, for our customer who we were advocating on behalf, this was a bit of a lurch and we ended up negotiating something, I would say, a bit different. But yeah. uh, any comments on that model? Yeah, I, I wonder how how well that's going to to do, I, and that's a new that's a brand new model. It's the first time we've seen that this year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, over the years, dam vendors have have charged based on everything you know from from by server to by user to user type, and then it was sort of volume of assets in the cloud. But I think I I I would be surprised if if many companies are going to 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 want to pay for that because DAM is just going to be connected to more and more things downstream uh, as, as the channel uh, as the channel distribution becomes richer and and, uh, and frankly more more personalized uh, based on on what you know about the customer. Yeah and I think one thing we still have to figure out is you know if it's a core asset do I know where all my children are <laughs> you know or do I know where I'm being shared and this has always been an issue in information management but I think it's becoming a particularly urgent issue in multi-channel with all of these touch points but um, but we'll leave that for the for the next webinar we're running a little bit over here so uh, maybe we should just uh, just close out I don't know I just encourage you all to check out our vendor map uh, which you can find on our site Definitely want to benchmark your own dam or other uh, digital effectiveness. You can try that out for free. It's a premium model. Um, paid subscribers get access to a lot more goodies, particularly in terms of benchmarking and getting advice about where to go next. And of course, you can always try any of our other decision-making tools. You can uh, and try any of our research by just going to realscorygroup.com backslash try. And uh, we look forward to engaging with you further. And Teresa, thanks for joining us today. Really enjoyed the conversation. Likewise. Thanks, everybody, and, for being here. Yeah, all right. So we'll uh, close it out with that. On behalf of Real Story Group, I'm Tony Byrne. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Have a good rest of your week. Bye now.